You know, as a kid, I grew up in church. Uh, I don't know about you guys. Um, I know that others did not grow up in church. Um, I, I grew up in church. There was a lot of things I had to uh, kind of deprogram and relearn about God. Uh, but I loved, I loved Easter Sunday morning. Easter Sunday morning. Remember, if you were a kid and you grew up in church, Easter Sunday morning was like an extra special Sunday. It's like when they pulled out all the stops, all the extra candy came out, all of the extra fun games happened, and as a kid you were just like, this is amazing, why can't we have every Sunday like this? Which we ought to have every Sunday like this. Because I don't know about you guys, but Jesus didn't just rise one day, Jesus is risen, he is alive all the time. Right? right? Come on. So why not? So then you had Easter, and then, you know, I, I, look, as a kid, can we just be open and honest about the whole thing? I mean, look, as a kid, we were looking for some chocolate. Let's admit it. And, you know, I don't know about you guys, but when you got like an Easter basket, did you feel the bunny to see if the bunny was hollow or solid? Right? And I had one of those. I, had, I remember the first year we had a hollow bunny. I think it was because inflation back in the 70s. Right? And uh, I remember like picking that bunny up and I squeezed it and it broke on the It broke. Right? And I hadn't even unwrapped it and I was already like a mess. I was like, my bunny broke. I can't believe it. Right? And, but the, the solid bunny, I mean, come on. You know the best Easter? The best Easter for me when I was a kid was when I discovered the Cadbury cream egg. Come on, somebody. I mean, when you got, yeah, people are cheering for that. It's like the resurrection of Jesus and the Cadbury cream egg. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. You, you broke that thing open, and it was like a candied egg inside of chocolate. And you were like, I'm proud to be an American. Where at least, <laughs> I mean, it was one of those epic moments, right? And I just, I loved it. I loved it. Easter egg hunts, when you would, you would go around and you would find the Easter eggs. How many guys, you did Easter egg hunts where you had like the plastic eggs that kind of snapped together and there would be little things in them. But how many guys just like, you picked up the ones that had the, the, like the pennies in it, you tossed that one, you looked for the one that had the dollars in it? Come on. Yeah. Or when you got back after everyone collected them all, you dug through your sisters and you took the dollar ones out of hers and you replaced it with the penny one. That's confession, by the way. God forgive me. I hope my sisters are watching right now. Yes, I know. Um, it's only a couple of bucks. Trust me. I'll pay you back someday. It's all going to be okay. But the best part of Easter, the best part of Easter as I started growing up, was realizing that something profound took place. That Jesus, who was crucified on the cross, went into a tomb, and that he rose again. And I don't know about you, but when you're a kid and you're hearing that story, there's something about the awe and the wonder that someone was dead in a tomb, and now he rose again from the grave. And I'm being told as a kid, this is my God, this is my Savior, this is my leader, this is my Lord. Guys, there is something about that, that Hollywood has yet to even eclipse that kind of awe and wonder. I mean, I know we got all kinds of incredible, amazing movies. No one's even touched the awe and the wonder of thinking to yourself that Jesus was once dead, lying there in a tomb. The stone was rolled over it. The guards were there. And that the stone rolled away, and Jesus walked out of the tomb. Like, as a kid, I'm telling you right now, there was an awe and wonder about that, and I'm wondering to myself, do you still have that awe and that wonder? Is that still inside of you? Are you still wowed by the fact that Jesus rose from the dead? Or are you sitting here like, yeah, I've heard it before? How sad of a case is it to live in a nation where we can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so openly and freely, and for us to, uh, for us to look at the resurrection and go, yeah, it's, it's a good thing. It's all right. No, there should be something that erupts on the inside of us. There should be something that kind of comes alive, where you realize this is a special day. There is no day like this day. That this day changed all of history. This, day, this day changed your life. This day changed everything. And we need to come back and capture the awe and the wonder again that Jesus is alive. I mean, think about it. Jesus, our Savior and Lord, he lived a sinless life. He preached the good news. He showed us what love is. 
He told us about the kingdom of God, and he told us about how you can actually get to heaven. That's good news. But then they arrested him, and they falsely accused him, and then they put him on a cross, and he ended up in a tomb, but then only to discover that three days later, Jesus came back to life. Easter, guys, is the celebration of our risen Savior. Jesus is alive. Amen? That's the celebration. Come on. Come on. Yeah. He's alive. And because he's alive, you can have hope. Because he's alive, you can have hope. You can have hope for tomorrow, that tomorrow can't be better than today. I know. I look around at our world, and we might be facing challenges. And we might be facing difficult times. And I realize that many of us are facing those difficult, challenging times. But I want you to know today you can have hope because Jesus is alive. I know the reality. The reality says this, that there's chaos all around us. That our nation is being ripped apart at the very seams. And that when you look around and you listen to the news and you hear the stories of what's happening in our nation, that violence and hate and division are happening. That inflation is, is, is striking many homes. That safety is something that people are having a hard time even finding anymore. But then I'm also watching the responses of people. And I'm watching people respond with fear. Fear. And fear is crippling, guys. If you look at this world and you look at the challenges and the difficulties that we're facing and you respond with fear, it cripples you. Fear acts like a monster inside of you and it just keeps growing every single day. And here's the, the harsh reality of fear is that fear steals hope from you. So if you're living your life today based on fear and fear is what's really guiding your life, then it's going to be hard for you to find the hope the hope that's found in Jesus is going to be hard for you to really rally around a day like today and let Easter really impact your life and let Easter restore joy. Let Easter restore peace to you. Let Easter kind of calibrate your new normal again. If fear is guiding your life, my friends, lay it down because fear steals hope. Fear steals the awe and the wonder that Jesus is alive. I watch how people are responding today and many people are responding with avoidance. I see the challenges and I see the difficulties and I'm just going to avoid it. If, if I just bury my head, bury my head in the sand and I don't watch any news, then the problems go away. That's not what happens. The problems are still there. They're waiting on you. If I just put myself in my nice little bubble, I live in Nebraska, I live in the central part of Nebraska, I live in small town America, like I just put myself in the bubble, then maybe somehow I can avoid all of the harsh realities that are happening out in our world today. But I'm telling you today that hope, hope can't live in avoidance. If you live in this avoidance mentality, like I'm just going to do my thing and let the rest of the world go to hell, then I'm telling you right now, hope is being robbed from you. Hope is being robbed from you. And I don't want to see that. I don't want you to avoid what's going on either. I also see how people are responding and some are trying to spend their way into a form of happiness. That maybe if I just buy that newer home, that somehow it will make me feel more secure and I can rise above the chaos that's happening in my world. Or that if I just spend more money and buy the things that just make me happy, that somehow I will see myself and I will be happy with myself and that's really all I need, isn't it, Jeff? Or maybe if I just get that new credit card deal, get that new credit card deal, it might it may relieve some of my financial tension. But I'm telling you today that when you live beyond your means, it depletes your hope. And we have many, many Americans, many who are listening to my voice right now, who are living beyond your means and it's robbing you of hope. And today you sit here and you want to celebrate a risen Savior who is fully in control. But you look at your life and you're like, my life is out of control. And many people feel stuck. Many Americans right now, people listening to my voice, they feel desperate. They want to somehow get back to some sense 
of, of normal. They want to somehow get back to some sense where life was good again. They want to somehow reverse the clock and go back a decade or just go back before COVID. But you can't go back. All you can do is keep moving forward. So many people feel stuck and they're looking for hope. I mean, they're looking for hope in all the wrong places. You're never going to find hope with you trying to be in control. You're never going to find hope with you just trying to avoid. You're never going to find hope trying to buy your way into happiness. So you can't purchase hope. You can't do that. So, so many people feel stuck. And I just want you to know today that Jesus says to us, because of Easter, because of the moment that Jesus is alive, Jesus says, you're not stuck. You do have another move. You're not stuck. You're not done. You do have another move. I want you to know today, I don't care where you're at. I don't care what type of lifestyle you're living. You have another move. I, I don't care if your marriage just got to completely destroyed and you just feel like you're stuck and like there's, there, there's no hope, I want you to know there's another move. You're here today and you're, you're controlled by substances, no matter what that substance is, no matter what that thing is, you're controlled by it and you're wondering, is there ever going to be a day where I'm free of this? I want you to know today, there is hope because Jesus rose again from the dead and he goes, I have another move for you. There's no matter where you're, no matter where you're coming from, doesn't matter what's going on in your life. Jesus keeps bringing the hope, and he keeps saying, if you trust me, if you lean into me, if you put your life in my hands, you have another move. There is a, uh, a painting that once used to hang in the Louvre Museum in Paris. And this painting, many people would come. They would come from all over the country. They would come from multiple countries. And they would walk through this famous museum. And they would stare at this painting because there was something about this painting that they kind of found themselves in this painting. There was just something about it that they just kind of leaned in. And they were like, something about that painting I see in me. Frederick Retsch is the guy who actually painted the painting. It no longer hangs in the Louvre Museum. In fact, it's been purchased and it's in a private collection right now. But the painting shows a man playing chess with the devil for his soul. Now, anybody here know how to play chess? Anybody here could care less? <laughs> there you go. I just want to make sure I included everyone. <clears throat> chess, chess is one of those games where each piece does something different. And not to overcomplicate it today, and I'm not going to teach you chess but every piece has its own move. Some pieces go diagonal. Some, people, some pieces have to go straight. Other pieces move a couple of spots. Others can slide all the way across the board. Some jump a couple and then over one. Very confusing. <laughs> the crux of the game, though, is to get your opponent to a place where his king can no longer make a move. And when the king can't make a move anymore, that's called, it's called checkmate. That's the goal of the game. The goal of the game is to get your opponent to a place where the king can't make any more moves. If the king makes a move, the king dies. So I want to bring you back to the painting. The painting is called Checkmate. It's a real painting. I'm not making this up. I just want you to stare at the painting for a little bit with me. I want you to dive into this painting as if you were at a museum and you were really trying to discover its true essence and the true story behind this. When you look at this painting, the man, the man doesn't have many pieces left. You see the angel kind of looking at the man, almost kind of with a look on the angel's face like, I think you're done. <laughs> That's the way it appears at least. The man doesn't seem like he has many pieces on the board. The man actually seems like he's contemplating the fact that maybe he's in checkmate. The devil seems to be very much in control, though. He seems like he's got it all under control, and he's even got a little bit of a smirk or a little bit of a glee on his face, and he's just waiting for the man to succumb to his victory while the man is sitting there serious and seemingly stressed out because of the looming doom of the defeat that's upon him. And through the years, people came they would come to the gallery and they would come and they would look at the painting that hung there. 
And they looked at it and they, they kind of saw the hopelessness of the situation. And in a way, people would stare at this painting and they would kind of feel a little bit like, this painting represents me. I feel stuck. I don't feel like I have any moves left. I feel like the course of my life has brought me to a place where I feel hopeless. Like, I don't, I think the enemy's got me. Like, I, I think that, like, what's the use of even trying? What's the use of even trying to thrive? What's the use of trying to live for God? Like, I just, I'm a failure. I can't live for God. I, I just keep failing. Like, sin keeps corrupting my life. I keep making bad choices. They keep leading to the destruction of my life. And people would stand there and they would look at it and there was something about this painting that would make them feel like, I identify with that man. I feel stuck. But one day, a great chess master was in Paris and he decided, I've got to see this painting. Like, I love chess. Like, this is what I do for a living. Right? I mean, I beat people from all over the world, and here we are in this great city, and I get a chance to actually lay my eyes on this checkmate painting. And so he went into the Louvre Museum, and he, and he walked through the Louvre, and he found the checkmate painting. And he stood there, and he was staring at the painting. And bystanders report that the man stood there for a long period of time. And he would watch him as he looked at the painting, and he would go, I'll just move that guy there, and maybe this, that guy there. And he was thinking three, four moves in advance. And he was looking at it, and then all of a sudden he was like stunned. And he was like, I, think, I don't think the man's in checkmate. I think the man actually has another move. And he played it out in his head. He was like, if he moves here, and then that happens, and then this happens. And he goes, I, gotta, I can't be right. Like, this thing's been called checkmate. Like, I'm a check. What am I missing? And he went back and he double checked his moves again, and he triple checked his moves, and then all of a sudden, with excitement inside of his heart, he disrupted the entire museum. And he goes, it's a lie. It's a lie. The king still has another move. And everybody was like, shh. It's a lie, guys. He goes, get the museum curator over here. And the museum curator came over and he goes, sir, you got to see this. Like, look, if the man moves here, and then that guy moves there, because that's the only move he'll have, then the king is here, and the man actually wins. The man's not done. The man has another move. This painting's got the wrong name on it. And although the devil, the devil seemed like he was winning, he was actually losing. And the man who thought he was losing was actually winning. But the man couldn't see it. The man was blinded to it. He was overcome with the stress of the moment, overcome with the details of the game. It was like he was caught in a moment and he couldn't see the fact that he actually had a way out. He couldn't tell that he still had another move. And church today, that's the message of Easter. The message of Easter is this, that you look at our lives and you look at our civilization and it seems like we're in checkmate. But then, all of a sudden, Jesus, who rose from the grave, he steps into your life. And if you listen to his voice today, here's what he's saying to every single person who's listening to me right now. He's saying this to you. You're not in checkmate. It's a lie. It's a lie. The king, Jesus, I still have another move. I want you to know today, that's Easter. That's Easter, and that's who our God is. Our God has always been the God of another move. Always. He's always been the God of another move. He's never stopped being the God of another move. Some of you may not know these stories, but I'm going to rattle through some of them really quick for you just to help you see. We serve a God who goes, he says this, you're not in checkmate. The king has another move. The Israelites, they were, they were in a valley facing off with, with Goliath and the Philistines. And they thought this was it, like Goliath, this giant of a man is going to take us out. The Philistine army is greater than us. And everyone was scared and no one wanted to fight Goliath. And all of a sudden, God goes, no, you're not in checkmate. I got another move for you. And he sends David, little boy, with a sling and a stone and he takes out the giant. You think you're stuck? You think you're facing giants? God goes, nope, I got another move for you. Daniel, one of God's prophets, gets thrown into a lion's den with lions that are starving and they throw men into it and the lions consume them and they come back the next day and it's just bones. Daniel, Daniel and all the other believers felt like Daniel had been checkmated only to wake up the next morning to realize, nope, God had another move. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're in the den with the lions 
and there's no way to get out of the situation that you're in, I want you to know today, we serve a God of another move. The disciples were with Jesus, and they're out on the countryside, far away from all of of the other towns, and they had 5,000 plus people there, and the people were hungry, and the disciples said, these people came to listen to you, Jesus, but there's no food to feed them with. What in the world are we going to do? We are in checkmate. And Jesus goes, go see what kind of food is out there. And one little boy had two fish and a few loaves of bread. And Jesus took them into his hands and he broke them and he kept breaking them. And God said, no, you're not in checkmate. I got another move for you. I'm going to keep providing fish and bread. So much that the people ate until they were full, the Bible said. And the disciples went around and picked up 12 basketfuls of leftovers. God can make another move in your life, not just to get you out of a situation, but to bring you into an abundance an abundance where there's leftovers. You think you're stuck, but one move and all of a sudden everything unlocks for you. And that one move is this, putting your hope and your faith in the lordship of Jesus Christ. Even if you feel like you failed him like Peter did. Peter felt like I failed God, like I'm in checkmate. How can I say that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ? I've been one of his disciples and then with the night that Jesus is arrested, I'm standing next to a fire and a young girl, the Bible says, says to me, aren't you one of those followers of Jesus? And I denied knowing Jesus, and the rooster crowed, and I walked away feeling like I was in checkmate, only to discover that God had another move for his life. And after the resurrection, Jesus went and he met Peter. He embraced Peter, and he called Peter friend. You have not failed God, my friends. You have not gone so far that, if, that you've gone beyond what Peter has done in denying knowing Jesus minutes after Jesus has been arrested, hours after he's been arrested. Like if you feel like you failed the Lord, you feel like you failed the gospel, you feel like you failed the church, you feel like you failed you know, the Bible, you feel like you failed, I just want you to know today, God has another move for you. He's wanting to embrace you today. He's wanting to call you friend. Even if today were your last day, like the thief who hung on the cross next to Jesus. Oh, he definitely felt like he was in checkmate. And I think everybody in this room would say, yep, that man was in checkmate. He's hanging on the cross. There is no hope for that man. Where is he going to turn now? Where is he going to go? But instead, here's what the man does. In his state of seemingly checkmate, he turns his head and he looks to Jesus. He doesn't turn away from Jesus like the other thief. He turns to look at Jesus, and he says, you are king of kings, and you are lord of lords. And then Jesus looks at the man, and he goes, I have another move for you, sir. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you right now, God always has another move for you. You're not in checkmate. You're not in checkmate. Jesus gave you another move when he defeated death. So there is a reason to have hope. The reason is this, hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. It's the reason why you can have hope. You can have hope because Jesus is hope. Today I gave you a chess piece when you came in. Would you just grab a hold of that chess piece? Now it all makes sense, doesn't it? You're like, what was this stupid piece of wood that I got? I don't even know what this is. Some of you are like, that's a chess piece? It's a chess piece. And I think your chess piece tells you a lot about you. If you kind of, because I saw some of you guys coming in the door. You came in the door and you looked at the chess pieces and you kind of glanced at them and you were like, I'm going to take that one. I'm going to take the big one. The big one always wins, right? I'm going to take the horse. I'm going to take the little pawn. I'm more, I'm more humble than the rest of you. <laughs> some of you just took it and you had no idea what it was. But today, I'm giving you a, piece, I'm giving you a chess piece. And what I want you to do with this is I want you to set it someplace for the next week or two. And I want want it to remind you. So I want you to set it maybe next to your sink where you get ready. Or I want you to set it on your nightstand. Or I want you to set it if you have like some kind of a shelf or a table right before you walk out the door. I want you to put it where you put your keys. And I I want it to remind you that when you feel stuck, Jesus is saying to you, you have another move. And when you feel life is overwhelming... When you feel like you're caught in a trap, I want you to know Jesus is saying to you, you have another move. If you're online, I'm sorry, I don't have a piece of chess for you, okay? Um, Maybe if you're at a neighbor's house or something like that and they have a chess board, when they're not looking, you can borrow one. (laughs) 
Just borrow it, though, all right? Because they're going to be really upset when they go to play the game. No, actually, just take a piece of paper and say, Jesus gave me one more move. And stick it on a mirror. Jesus gave me one more move. You have another move, my friends. And that's because hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. I want to wrap up today with a, with a challenging but yet inspiring passage of Scripture for us. 1 Corinthians is where I want to take you. It will be on the screen, and I want you to kind of like follow along with me. Because as this Scripture is going to portray for you, it's going to help you see that yes, there was a resurrection of Christ. And through his resurrection, you were given another move. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 23. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there is no resurrection of the dead? Why are some of you saying that there is not another move? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless. Easter would be useless and your faith then would be useless. And we apostles, we would, be tr- we would be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the, from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost have no move. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, man, that we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But listen to the good news, church. But in fact, the good news is this, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. There is another move. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man named Adam, Now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man named Jesus. And just as as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ has been given a new life. But listen to the ending. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all, you and me, who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back to life. We will be given another move, my friends. This passage is a powerful passage, and it drives home some incredible statements that I just want you to hear about hope. This passage reminds us that we have hope because our faith isn't in some fake statue, but our faith is in a risen Savior. Don't doubt the fact. Don't doubt the fact that Jesus rose again from the grave. If you doubt the fact that Jesus rose again from the grave, then your faith is useless then this life is useless. Then there's nothing worth living for. We're just gonna be here. We're dust of this earth and then we're gonna go back to dust and that's it? You just get this short little window of 75, 85 years if you've done it well? That doesn't have a lot of hope. Hope comes from the fact that we we don't worship a statue made of bronze or gold or silver. No, we worship a risen Savior who's sitting at the right hand of the Father right now, ready to come back for his church for those who are wanting to follow him. We have hope. Here's another reason why we have hope. We have hope that we will raise from the dead. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead first. He is the first of a great harvest. And for those of you who put your hope and your faith in him, you too will rise again. So if you feel stuck, you have another move. Why? Because Jesus rose first. We have hope because our sins can be forgiven Yes, we were all born into this world under the sin of the one man named Adam. But because of the grace and the love of Jesus Christ who gave his life on the cross and who rose again from the grave and conquered death, hell, and the grave, you and me, we have been given another move. And we have hope because this world is not where life ends. But there is a gateway to heaven. And that stairway to heaven That road to heaven, that bridge to heaven was built off of the cross of Jesus Christ and the resurrection when he conquered death and the grave. We have hope. There's a lot to put your hope in. 
Hope has a name, church, and his name is Jesus. Jesus gave you another move. So can I just encourage you with something today? Seize the move. Take advantage of the move. Make a move towards Jesus today. If today you are outside of a relationship with God, take advantage of the move Jesus gave you and take a step towards him. Humble your life before him. Repent to him. Say, Jesus, I, I, I need you to be my Lord and my leader. Be like the criminal on the cross today. And turn to Jesus and say, you are King of kings and you are Lord of lords. And you too, my friends, will see Jesus going, you're not stuck. I've got to move for you. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. It's all about humbling your life before God. It's all about seeking his forgiveness. It's all about just going, Jesus, you are who you said you are. You rose from the grave so that I can raise from the grave too. That there is something beyond this world. Put your hope in him. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to know something today. Don't let Easter just be another Sunday. Don't let there just be a mundaneness to Easter. Jesus actually rose from the grave. There is an empty tomb. You can go to Israel. You can check out the empty tombs. One of those empty tombs is Jesus' empty tomb. Nobody knows exactly which one it is, but whichever one you walk into that's empty, you might as well say, this could have been your tomb because you're not here anymore. So if you're a believer today, you need to know that when I invite you to stand in a moment and you start lifting your voice and worship unto, unto God, also lift the voice of your heart unto him. Because we worship a risen Savior who is not dead, and he hears you today. He loves you today. He is for you today. Our God gave us another move. We are not stuck. Hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. Why don't you stand with me, and let's pray. Come on. Father, thank you. Thank you for the fact that, Lord, like a chess game, that when we feel like we're stuck and there's no more moves and it feels like the king, which we kind of put ourselves in that position as the king, it feels like there is not another move. Lord, you, you cry out, it's a lie. It's a lie. The king has another move. God, you're saying that to us today. It's a lie. Don't believe the lie. You have another move. Lord, what you're wanting us to do is make a move towards you. Surrender our lives, to humble ourselves, and to let Jesus rule and reign in our lives. Lord, we love you this Easter. And now as we turn our hearts towards you in worship, we're going to lift our voice up. God, we're going to raise the roof. We're going to break through the roofs of all of our facilities as we lift up our voice and proclaim that Jesus is alive. That hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. And everybody that agrees with that, shouts amen.